All right, let's see who's out there. If anybody. All right, guys, how I usually run reviews is you guys lead the review. I'm here to clarify uh, uh, material, content. Um, so you guys need to uh, let me know what you want me to clarify. Let's see who's going to break the ice first. Break, break the ice. Woo, break, break, break the, the ice. Hey, good morning. Ooh, we got two coming in hot at the same time. Does anyone have a question about isometric exercise used in the circle diagram? So remember, guys, the circles don't tell you if how muscles are contracting. 310 tells us how to figure out what group of muscles are doing a job above rest or contracting. And what the circles do is help us to see who's in that group, okay? So if you notice, Madison and others who have the same question, which I know some of you do, if you look on your circles, you're never going to see the word isometric, concentric, eccentric, because those are all types of um, contractions or shortenings being lengthened or no change while trying to shorten, that is a function of things that pull. All the circles do is tell you who pulls in what direction of motion. Who pulls in what direction of motion? Isometrically, the bicep pulls in the same direction of motion isometrically as it does concentrically, as it does eccentrically, as it does at rest. The direction of motion doesn't change. So an example about isometric exercise would be for this test. Um, if the tibialis anterior is working isometrically, give me a function at the ankle joint and the subtalar joint. Well, isometric doesn't change its function. The same answer would be if the tibialis anterior was working concentrically or if the tibialis anterior was working eccentrically or if the tibialis anterior was just at rest, it pulls in the direction of ankle joint dorsiflexion. So it's a dorsiflexor. It pulls in the, in the direction of subtalar joint inversion, making it an inverter. So, so and, and Madison, you may know that. I'm just using your question as a way to reiterate that your circles have nothing to do with contraction type. It has everything to do with direction of pull, okay? So that's an example of using isometrics to ask a function question. But it would be the same answer if it was concentric, eccentric, isometric, at rest, tibialis anterior, ankle joint, dorsiflex, or subtalar joint inverter. That's what your circles show, direction of pull. Some more examples of the hip um, in anatomical position. What does the piriformis do? What's its function? It's an abductor and an external rotator. What does the rectus femoris do at the hip? It's a hip flexor. Uh, what does the gracilis do at the hip? 
It's an adductor. Uh, what does the uh, quadratus femoris do at the hip? It's an external rotator. What are the three functions of the tensor fascia lata at the hip? Hip flexor, hip abductor, hip internal rotator. Um, how would you stretch uh, the semimembranosus at the hip? Well, it's a hip extensor, so I'd stretch it by flexing the hip. As I flex, it's going to get longer. Um, what does the adduct, uh, um, what does the gluteus medius do at the hip? It's a hip abductor. The anterior fibers are hip internal rotators. Okay. Um, Go into Jade's question. So I'm going to try to merge Jade and that. I'm going to try to merge Jade and Allie's question. So it's a hip example and it's a speed up, slow down. So you guys might have speeding up and slowing down. So biomechanists, we try physics people, we try to make things simple. Think think about astrophysicists. They don't have fancy names for the a black hole. I mean, just it's a black hole, right? Just a like, like there's no fancy names. We try to make things simple. So fancy terms for slow down, speed up is stretch shortening cycles and, and plyometric sequence. But I, I just try to simplify it and say, man, you got to speed up, you got to slow down. And in the neck, I gave one where you speed up and you slow down and you do that in the hip. Like when you're sprinting, you have to speed up hip flexion but then you got to slow down hip flexion. Then you got to speed up hip extension. Then you got to slow down hip extension. Then you got to speed up hip flexion. We did that in 310, okay? So I'll use layman's terms like speed up, slow down, slow down, speed up to make sure we're all on the same page about what's happening. I, I prefer to use layman's terms because it's easier for us to understand what's happening. Um, so... In the case of the hip, if we're doing that, if you're going to, let's see, let's say you're doing a squat, okay, and you take the, the, the weight off of the rack, well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to speed up hip flexion, right? But the hip flexion is going to speed up because the hip extensors allowed it to speed up with eccentric work letting the weight be greater than their contribution to the hip and knee and ankle joint motions. So speeding up hip flexion, hip extensors through eccentric work, weight more than muscle work. Who are your hip extensors? Semimembranosus, semitendinosus, biceps femoris, long head, gluteus maximus. What speeds up must slow down, right? So I got to slow down the hip flexion again, through eccentric work, but now my muscles have to work greater than the weight to slow it down. And then as I slow it down, I'm going to change its direction. And the same muscles that put on the brake is going to put on the gas. So now I'm going to speed up hip extension through concentric work, same muscles. If you're working the same hip muscles, the hip extensors. Um, so if you specifically want speeding you up and slowing you down in terms of different muscles do it, like in the case of the neck, then you would have to, it's kind of trickier with the hips because uh, they don't allow as much motion. Um, but imagine if you were flexed. So this is my hip and you're flexed and you just tried to abduct as fast as you can and then slow it down. Right. So um, I could do the exact same thing with my shoulder. Just think about it as the hip. So I do this as fast as I can horizontal abductors would speed you up and then horizontal abductors would slow you down. So uh, think about if you're just sitting and you just tried to flare out your legs as fast as you could, horizontal abductors would speed you up and horizontal abductors would slow you down. And for the most part, they're the same as our regular ab and abductors. Um, if you also wanted to look at internal and external rotation, like if you were Michael Jackson doing a move, hee <laughs> hee, and you did internal external rotation real fast, uh, then if you started with the hip in, in its anatomical position in terms of rotation, 
then it would take external rotators to speed you up. And then if you wanted to slow it down faster than gravity, it'd take internal rotators to slow you down. Okay. So those are two specific questions uh, directly. I tried to merge them uh, so that we could do another Jade question with an alley question. And then I got specific to alley, specific question about speeding up and slowing down. Okay, Rachel, so is your question, which muscles cross knee and hip? I, I just want to make sure. Uh, you're welcome, Jade. Uh, Rachel, is your, is, uh, is your question specifically, which muscles function at both knee and hip? Okay, great. So let's just work our way around uh, the, the knee. So one way you can look at this to try to simplify it is, and I would do it with the knee because there's less muscles at the knee is literally go through the knee, every muscle in your circle, and then ask your question, do I see this muscle up at the hip? So let's do the anterior compartment. Vastus medialis, don't see it up there. Vastus lateralis, medialis intermedius, don't see it up there. Rectus femoris, oh, I see it up there, right? It's a hip flexor. Hip flexor, knee extensor, Okay. That knocks out our anterior compartment. I only had one muscle that has a knee hip function, our rectus. Now let's go to the posterior. Popliteus. No, don't see it up there. Gastrocnemius. I see it down there at my ankle, but I don't see it up there at the heat. So, no. Sartorius. Yep. Hip flexor, knee flexor. Gracilis. Yep. Hip adductor, knee flexor, semimembranosus, yeah, knee flexor, hip extensor, semitendinosus, yep, knee flexor, hip extensor, biceps femoris. This is the tricky one. Both heads cross the knee, so that's why I could say biceps femoris, inferring both heads. The twins went to get ice cream, but the but both twins don't have to do everything together. So both heads do not go and cross up at the hip, only the long head of the biceps femoris. So for that one, only the long head crosses both. The long head merges with the short at the knee as a knee flexor, and the long head goes and crosses the hip posteriorly in the back for a hip extensor. So we should have seven to account for. Popliteus, only knee. Gastrocnemius, knee and ankle. Popliteus, gastrocnemius, sartorius, hip and knee, gracilis, hip and knee, semimembranosus, hip and knee, semitendinosus, hip and knee, biceps femoris, long head, hip and knee. Did that help? You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Ooh, Emily, absolutely. Now, for the record, I'm only giving you guys this because I know a lot of you work in clinics and um, you're going to need to know this stuff eventually because it's just so cool. So basically what happens is Let's say here is the, 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 the hip. Here's the hip, but this is the leg, okay? And let's say this little pin notch is the insertion. So where, where the little Z grip is, that's the insertion of the piriformis, okay? So the piriformis crosses lateral, but not all the way lateral. Because if it crossed all the way lateral, it wouldn't have any rotation. It kind of has an obliquity to it, okay? So this is in the back, posterior. So some of its cross is going to be lateral, but some of its cross is going to be transverse, okay? Now, what happens is, is that if you think about it, if this is the line of pull, if I flex my hip and I flex about this much, well, now all of that pull is kind of abduction or horizontal abduction. And if I keep flexing, well, now all of a sudden, instead of pulling laterally, it switches its function and it now pulls medially. Okay. 
we now have precedent about that with the brachioradialis. And you actually have other muscles that can switch function based on your joint position. The pec major is one of those. Down here, it pulls in a direction of adduction, but up here, it pulls in a direction of abduction. It's still doing the same thing, trying to bring your arm to your thorax. But if my arm is below 90, the shortest distance is adduction. And if it's above 90, the shortest distance is abduction. So we can switch functions of muscles. Now, the important thing here is this. Because we have certain muscles that can switch function, I'm very clear that all of your function questions are going to be from anatomical, unless otherwise noted with the brachioradialis and stuff. So, so unless I tell you you are in some new position, we are going to infer that these are anatomical position type function questions. So therefore, the piriformis is still an abductor external rotator in anatomical. But that's actually why when you do a piriformis stretch, some of you, and the reason I'm telling you this is because some of you, it may be like, well, wait, I, I don't understand. If, if the piriformis is an external rotator, why when I do the piriformis stretch and I'm externally rotating, am I stretching it? Um, and that's why, that if you flex enough, you can actually switch its function and make it an internal rotator. So therefore, by externally rotating, you can stretch it. Okay. Emily, does that clarify that question for you? You're very welcome. Anybody want to remind me what your second test muscle coverage is? Remind me. I want to make sure y'all aren't studying stuff that's on the third test. Ankle, subtalar, knee, and hip. Yeah, absolutely. Good. We're gonna we're gonna break this up into little bites. Um, so that way we don't get too overwhelmed. Okay. So ankle, subtalar, knee, hip. Now keep in mind hip to pelvis stuff, right? So I can have pelvic girdle rotations and have hip muscles responsible. The hip muscles influencing hip motion can do pelvic girdle rotations, but I don't have pelvic girdle rotators per se, because those muscles can change. I can have, you remember from 310, I could be hanging from a bar and have pelvic girdle rotation because of trunk muscles. And so that's why we don't typically say pelvic girdle rotators, because they could be obliques or they could be, you know, tensor fasciolata. So, uh, so, so even though hip muscles in this exam can be responsible for pelvic girdle rotation, it still comes back to the hip perspective of muscles, which specific muscles made the pelvis spin because of the hip motion, hip muscles.
Are y'all ready for some cool weather? Waiting for the cold front. Cold front, yeah. Da -da 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 -da. Come on, baby, cold it with me. Cold front, yeah. Cold front, yeah. Da -da 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 -da. All right, I stop. I'm always embarrassing my, my sons with my with my dad jokes. Not completely, huh? I wish I had my Bucky puppet with me. I'd do. Uh, I'd give y'all some uh, encouraging words from Bucky. Did y'all enjoy Bucky uh, on my little review on my little uh, post? Hey, everybody! I hope you guys all make A's. I'm such a goof. So while we're waiting for other questions, I can tell you that exam three is going to be on obviously upper extremity muscles, right? So wrist, elbow, radio, ulna, shoulder, scapula. And then test four is going to put the concepts of muscles, how muscles work in influencing motion. And that'll be uh, your last test. Hey, Jada, thank you for the question. Will we have open and closed chain examples again? If so, can we review some of those? Um, let's see. Yeah, I can't because I'm tethered. I can't get up and do some of them. But what I can do is get on my little uh, cellular device and try to do something. Let's see. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so something like this, maybe. Okay, so what if we did like a, uh, so what if we did like a squat, right? So like, a, um, and I said, uh, let's see, I need to make sure I flip it right. So we start on the right and we come back to the left. And then we got to say, well, okay, great. What are we going to have a conversation about? Are we going to have a knee conversation or a hip conversation? If it's the knee, I'm using my knee extensors, right? To let me go down, slow me down, stop me, keep me in that position, or to make me go up. It's the same muscles. So what 415 helps you do is say, okay, well, let me make sure I account for all those muscles. So instead of just saying quad or knee extensors, we can look at our circle and say, okay, well, those knee extensors are the anterior crossing muscles. Who sits in the front of class of the knee class? Rectus femoris, vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius. And then we have the hip conversation. I'm going to be working my hip extensors, letting me down, slowing me down, speeding me up, coming up, same muscles. Same external force, same agonist variations in motion because of variations in contraction, right? So who are the hip extensors? If I figure out that I'm working my hip extensors, who are the hip extensors? I look in my hip circle. Those are the posterior crossing muscles. Gluteus maximus, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, biceps femoris, long head. Yes, um, that's a great, I think I clarified that at the beginning, but I'm glad you asked because I need to remember that just because I say stuff, first of all, I may not have said it, but I need to repeat it because I can't remember things, random bits of information my family tells me. So they need to repeat themselves. So every test is going to have 25 questions. And again, the logic is I want to give you uh, roughly two minutes a question. 
So I want to give you time to think. I want to give you time to figure out. I, I, this can't be rapid fire stuff. This has to be conceptual stuff. So to give you the adequate amount of time, I need to limit the number of questions and make every question very important. So 25 questions. But unlike the first test, I'm not going to forget to ask. Uh, I think the first test, I forgot to ask trunk questions like a goof. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. How about those Cajuns, huh? Last second field goal. I'd have to kick a ball four times to make it go 53 yards at my age. That was awesome. Saints? Eh, not so much. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, the concept is it's a, it's a function of things that pull. If you think um, if this represented a, a rubber band or a TheraBand and my hands move apart, it's going to make the rubber band pull more back my hands together, right? So just keep in mind, it's a natural function of elasticity. So I'm going to use my wrist as my ankle. And they're related. They're not the same thing, but they're related. And if I want to stretch top muscles, I need to move my ankle like this. And if I want to stretch front crossing muscles, I need to move my ankle like this. For lack of a better term, if I want to stretch wrist flexors or in the ankles case plantar flexors i need to extend my wrist dorsi flex my ankle so dorsi flexion or being in a dorsi flexed position is going to stretch plantar flexors things that pull the other way and this, the opposite right if i want to stretch extensors i need to flex my wrist well remember the ankle has two different forms of flexion it's super cool in that regard because you can get into fetal position with your feet on the ground or off the ground. And if your feet are off the ground, then plantar flexion is going to help you get into a ball like a gymnast or a diver, right? Or if you're in bed and you're in a fetal position, your toes are going to be pointed down because your feet aren't on the ground. But if you're weight bearing, getting into a ball is going to elicit dorsum flexion, dorsi flexion. So let's remember, there's no extension of the ankle. There's two different forms of getting into a ball feet on or off the ground. Okay, so how would I stretch inverters? By everting. How would I stretch everters? By inverting. And, and now all you got to do is say, well, how do I stretch inverters by everting? Well, who are my inverters, right? So my subtalar joint inverters are everything on the medial side of class. Tibialis anterior, extensor halicus longus, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, flexor halicus longus. So any one of those muscles, I could say, you know, hey, well, how would I stretch it at the subtalar joint? Well, those muscles on the medial side, I need to evert to lengthen what's pulling medially. Okay. Give me 10 minutes, Perry. I'll let you in. It's my son's uh, get it get. Okay. So does that help? I'll tell you what. Jada, let me know if that clarified that. I'm going to go let my son's kitty cat. He has like a trap door on the window. That, our cats are weird and spoiled. I'll be right back. Y'all ask some more questions, and then I'll come back and review them.
Yay, you're welcome. So yeah, stretching, let's see. Wow, what a what a great question. Um yeah, yeah it uh, man, there's a there's a lot to Armand that that depends. And it depends on a concept of center of pressure. So what I mean by that is if you are if you put a lot of pressure on your toes, if if your weight is up on your toes, then your plantar flexors are going to be absolutely helping, but not in the traditional sense. They're going to be working, pulling on the shin in a direction of plantar flexion, not like we're used to. Okay. However, if you have your pressure on your heels, like, um, like maybe doing a Smith machine squat, uh, or a ball squat, uh, then that kind of minimizes, uh, the contribution of the plantar flexors to that system. Um, one thing I've, I've said in my, in my lectures previously, I don't know if I said it to you guys, but in closed chain, the knee is kind of an illusion. The knee is what you get when you move the hip and the ankle at the same time, because in a simultaneous movement strategy like that, if your hips and your ankles are moving, your knee has no other choice. Okay. So because there's so much variability with center of pressure, if you're if you put a lot more force towards uh, the ball of your foot, then that's going to increase contribution of the of those plantar flexors uh, to the ankle motion. Versus if you put more force towards the heel of your foot, that's going to put less contribution uh, to your plantar flexors. Um, so the answer to your question is yeah, but to the degree really depends on where your your foot pressure is. Um, and then again, if you can, again, with, with uh, Smith machines or ball squats, if you could keep your ankle, uh, uh, you know, if you, you can minimize ankle uh, motion, then a majority of that stuff will be knee and hip. Uh, but even then, when you come up, that, 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 that knee is going to do this, and therefore you're going to get uh, ankle motion. Uh, sometimes that ankle motion could be because of inertia uh, in some of those modified squat exercises uh, because of the emphasis of the knee and the hip, and then the ankle just goes along for the ride. So I'm going to answer your question by saying, yeah. But again, the illusion. Typically, we think of ankle stuff like this, right? But the plantar flexors can literally do this. They can pull on the shin like this. Come here, let you go down, make you go up. And um, yeah, Allie, absolutely, but that doesn't mean everybody does. Just because you, you, you should do it doesn't mean everybody does. And it's hard to, it's hard to measure, right? How do, unless you have a fancy force plate, which is a lot of money, how do you know if someone's put, you know, if you're working with a client or you're working with an athlete and you're telling them to do it, you know, it's, uh, and not only that, but to Armand's point, you get more muscle help when you kind of get more on, on your ball. So, uh, so you're supposed to, it, it's safer, uh, but, but it's hard to measure. It's hard to, to see if they're doing it. Okay. I, I'll say it's hard. It's challenging. It, it's, it's challenging. So, uh, so yeah, you get, let me see if I could write this. It, it's super cool. I think we touched about this in 310, but I think you guys, uh, will find this, uh, awesome. So, okay. So ankle plantar flexors. So when we're coming up, you have this hydraulic system, right? So ankle plantar flexors are pulling on the shin back there, right? Which would be pulling in a direction of ankle plantar flexion. Well, watch what else is happening. You have hamstrings pulling on the tibia in that same direction. So again, even though the hamstrings are coming from the hip, they cross the knee, but instead of being a knee flexor in a closed chain setting, think about it. If they're pulling this way, wouldn't that pull the whole system in one? So the hamstrings technically are hip extensor, knee extensors, and plantar flexors. And my point is, is all these muscles are all working on three different joints all at the same time. And you get the quad that's pulling on the patella. Muscles can only pull, but they pull on bones. And guess what? Bones can push. 
So you get your quad exerting this type of influence in the same direction, which is influencing knee extension, but at the same time, hip extension at the same time, ankle plantar flexion. So all of those muscles are all on the same team, pulling in the same overall direction of motion. That explains why people can squat ridiculous amounts of weight because there's some biomechanical magic happening there. And when we talk about moment arms and torques, right? And we say, well, muscles don't really have tor like, like large torques physiologically, but biomechanically, there's some tricks we could do where this patella is driving into the knee. Look how far away that force is being applied to the hip. That's a big moment arm by that patella. Look how far it's being applied to the ankle. That's a big moment arm of that patella. And that's why your patella, when you flex and extend your knee and you feel all that popping and grinding, that's your patella has a heck of a lot of friction uh, that wears away and tracks and, and, and gets irritated and pops and clicks. And, and your patella is, you ask a lot of your patella. We should have a national patella day. Um, so, uh, so Armand, the answer to your question, absolutely. Uh, but we can vary it based on center of pressure, uh, on our foot. Man, y'all are asking some outstanding questions. I dig it. So for, so for this test, all right, remember, ankle, knee, hip. For grad school, then you guys could be like, well, technically, uh, the, 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 the hamstrings are knee extensors. That's graduate school stuff. That is, that is grad school closed chain hydraulic concepts that you, you – let's not go there for this class, all right? Keep it simple. And it's not, again, I've, I've said it several times, it's not that I'm lying to you. It's just that there's more to the story. Uh, Cinderella could be a five-page children book or it could be a three-hour epic movie. It's just adding more to the story. Let's see. Okay, okay. Uh, Jasa. Okay. Um, the, if you're in anatomical position, if you're in anatomical position, here's your pelvis, here's your hip. Right hip abduction, right lateral pelvic girdle rotation, you still you have the exact same change in angle. So right lateral pelvic girdle rotation, if my right hip is on the ground, would be right hip abduction. Right hip abduction. A to B is the same as A to B. Let me see if I could do it like this. A to B is the same as A to B. Two different global spins, but the same local spin, okay? So if I'm in anatomical position, then lateral pelvic girdle rotation is going to be because of right or left hip ab or adduction, depending on what I do. Now, remember in 310, I can get my hip out of anatomical position. So I can have lateral pelvic girdle rotation because of right and left hip internal and external rotation if my hip is flexed. Um, but that was a 310 thing. It could still be applied to 415, but I taught you guys that in, in 310. Um, so... Pelvis lateral and anatomical position, it's because of ab or adduction. Thank you for that question, by the way. I like my artwork. Some good stuff, huh? That's also why we can bench more than we can pull. You know, we can squat more than we could pull. You get this hydraulic effect. Uh, you get, when you're pushing on things, push type influences, you get bone contributing muscles pull on bone. Bones can push on things. And you get this pushing effect of, uh, of when you're pushing on things. You get the compression effect of, of bone push. Uh, which is something you don't get when you pull on things. When you think about it, when you're pulling on things, bone is trying to be pulled apart from bone. When you're pushing on things, bone is compressing into bone. 
And so you get some, uh, some secondary help when you push on stuff. I'm going to treat myself to lunch today, guys. Where do I, where do I go? What's uh what's your go-to place? Uh, for lunchy munchies. There's this place in New Orleans that I want to go to bad. I think it's called Blue Oak. Let's check it out. This place right here. <clears throat> it looks so good. It's like this chicken sandwich from heaven. Blue Oak barbecue. Spicy chicken sandwich. My heart. There's nothing wrong with Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Stay fresh. My first job out of high school was, was Subway. I was a sandwich artist. I got my first paycheck, and it was like 76 bucks, and I thought I was rich. I went to Walmart and just bought all kinds of stupid stuff. It's because I was so excited. Oh, God, Market Eats. <gasps> That's some yums. Yums. I tell you what, if everybody on the test makes an A, I'll treat everybody to lunch. I'm that guy. All right, guys, last call for questions. I got to go start writing your test. <laughs> Free food. Heck yeah, man. Oh, I'm not in a bind. $5 Little Caesars, man. $5 Little Caesars got me through college. And went back in my, back in my day, uh, Burger King used to have 99 cent Whoppers and I would literally go with a wheelbarrow and just buy as much spare change that I had to buy Whoppers and I froze them, put them in the freezer when they would do the special for like that week or whatever. I would hoard 99 cent Whoppers. Got to do what you got to do. Okay, so we're all good. <laughs> Dude, 99 cent whoppers, man. I literally went out like, imagine Santa with a sack, right? About to go deliver toys. That was me and whoppers in my backpack, but I wasn't giving them away. I was hoarding them. They were mine. My precious, my precious. All right, guys. I'm going to head out. I hope you all are well. Rewatch the lectures. Remember, uh, it's just ankle, sub Taylor, knee. You're very welcome. And uh, I want you all to how long is the test? If you have class time. I, and actually, I gave you an extra 10 minutes. So it's an hour. Same as last. All right, guys. Later.